Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast on the Class. Breakfast on the Class today is sponsored by Sinem Mafar, dedicated in celebration and honor of his wife's birthday, Tanaz Mafar, Mazal Tov. As well, Li'ilui Nishmat, Li'el Dina Bat Ephraim Alala Shalom Namdar, this young girl, 15 years old, who passed away, unfortunately, in this terrible drunk driving accident on Saturday night, Shem Yun Komdama, and Be'ezat Hashem, uh, her family should experience Nehama in this very difficult time. As well, Lilui uh, Nishmat, Philip Noach Yehuda ben Moshe Meir Lava Shalom, who we've been dedicating classes to this week. And as well, to another young man who passed away before his time, Yehoshua Arye Leib ben Malka Esther Yonatan Haim HaKohen Kar. Alava Shalom. <clears throat> Uh, on a happier note, Breakfast in the Class also sponsored by Isaac Sasson, dedicated in honor of his wife Barbara, and in celebration of the birth of their son, Mantob, Mazal Tob, Mabruka Mazal Tob. Thank you for sponsoring Breakfast, and as well, for the cold brew, you should be zochet to have unbelievable nahad from your son. <clears throat> My friends, the Pasuk says, an interesting language. You know, Yaakov Avinu passes away, and the brothers are very, very worried. <clears throat> and they say to themselves, Lu yistemenu Yosef. Maybe, perhaps, Yosef will hate us now. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll have some sort of deep hatred towards us. And he's going to pay us back. <clears throat> he's going to pay us back for, uh, for what happened with, for what happened with, uh, you know, with the selling of Yosef all those years ago. Now that dad's out of the way, you know, who knows how he's going to react. So the brothers come to Yosef and they concoct a story that Yaakov told them before he died to ask that Joseph should forgive them, etc., etc. Yosef can't believe it. He's crying. He can't believe that they would suspect him of hating them. Okay? And Yosef instead speaks to them, uh, and Yosef speaks, he, he comforts them, and he speaks to their heart. Rashi says, what does it mean that he speaks to their heart? What does that mean? And he explains that in speaking to their heart, he explained to them how valuable they were to him. How all this time, he was a leader in Egypt, but nobody knew who his family was. No one knew who his brothers were, who his father was. So he was just the slave from the pit that rose to prominence. But now that his brothers were there, each one tall in stature, regal in appearance, now they knew from whence he came, what kind of family he came from. And he said, you don't know how much it means to me that you're here with me in Egypt today. My friends, I want to look, I want to address both of these concepts with you today. Rabbi Tversky has an unbelievable chidush. Now, every time you see the word lu in the Torah, Lu usually means not perhaps, but a perhaps of, of longing. Okay? What, what does that mean? It's not like maybe, it's more like if only. Lu. Okay? Lu ami shome ali, if only my people would listen to me. Israel my if Israel would follow in my ways. That's what God says. Lu. Okay? Lu means if only. What does pen mean? Pen means if only in a bad way. Like maybe, barmenan. Right? Like we said, pen yiftelevavchem. Maybe your heart will lead you astray. So the nuance in the language of Hebrew describes two different maybes. The Jewish people is a people that is always thinking about the future. And one of the ways to understand a lot about a culture is by looking at the nuance that they have in words in their culture for any given thing. I always point this out. There are many different words in, in Jewish, in Lashon HaKodesh, for speech. Vayomer, Vayedaber, Vayaged, right? All these different words speak about, uh, they speak about speaking because Talking is very important to Jews. Okay? You have other religions that have 900 different words for the word food. (laughs) 
Why? Because what's important to that uh, culture? The food is the most important. I imagine there's a lot of different words in Spanish for dancing. Right? Because the culture is one uh, that is very into its dance, into its rhythm, etc., into its music. Sorry? Yeah, Okay. Now, the point is, Rabbi the point is, and I think this is very important, the fact that there's two different words in the Hebrew language for maybe, one which is maybe of a positive nature, and one which is maybe of a negative nature, Ill- illustrates that the Jewish people are all about the future. We contemplate a maybe that's a positive maybe, and we contemplate a maybe that's a negative maybe. Maybe my son will turn out to be a big Talmi Chacham, inshallah. That's, we always talk about that in, in the Arabic word, inshallah, all the time we throw it out because we're talking about maybes that are positive. From the time you're eight years old in the Syrian community, you go anywhere, you do anything, Abu Sabi, Aris, inshallah. Those are positive maybes. You know, we hope you get married, you hope you have uh, sons, you hope you, you know, etc., etc. There's also negative maybes. But I'm a you know, not, not, to, not on us, in other words. Hashem should save us. Which one is Lu? Lu is, we said, a positive maybe. Wild. Listen to the, what the brothers say. Lu yistemenu Yosef. Maybe, if only, Joseph would hate us. What should it say? Pen, maybe, barmenan, God forbid, Yosef will hate us. It's almost like they want Yosef to hate them. Why? My friends, I want to share with you a powerful idea. If Yosef needed Vayinachem to give them comfort, it means that Joseph saw in his brothers, he saw that they needed to be comforted. They needed to be told why they were important to him. And I learned even in the encapsulated, in the parenthetical uh, element of that pasuk, that the greatest comfort that a person can feel in times of stress and in times of difficulty is to be told what they mean to you. The most comforting thing in the world is to know that you matter to someone. And he comforted them. Why? How? By telling them, you know what you mean to me. It's so important to me that you're here with me. But my friends, there's a deeper level of understanding here. Why did the brothers need to be comforted? The brothers needed to be comforted because while Yosef had moved on, they had not. While Yosef had forgiven and moved on, they had not. And I think we speak a lot about in the topics of classes and in the topics of learning, we speak a lot about giving forgiveness. But maybe we don't speak enough about receiving forgiveness, accepting forgiveness. The brothers on some level, Rabbi Tversky explains, were hoping to be punished. You know, there's a famous line, it goes, killing them with kindness. Let's say as an example, you know, your wife, she gets really angry at you. She says something not so nice, a little bit mean. A husband, maybe perhaps, he does make a mistake. He gets angry at his wife. He does something that he knows is going to get her very upset. He comes home. Hacker, he's shaking like this. So he walks in, he tries to be, you know, he told he's going to be home in 20 minutes. She called him. An hour later, he's like, no, no, five more minutes. A half hour later, he's still not home. <clears throat> he knows. He walks in that door. He needs a suit of armor, okay? So he tries to diffuse. He's like, uh, honey, uh, everything, I, I'm home. <laughs> he's looking like this, Right? He finally finds out, he's like, oh, how are you doing today? Oh, you look great, this dress looks amazing on you. <laughs> right? If his wife says, oh, I'm glad you're here, complete, he's a little bit nervous. He'd rather be told, what happened? 
I remember once when I was very young, I, uh, I skipped school one day. I was maybe in seventh grade. And when I got home, my mother said to me the line that no son wants to hear. If I got punished, I came downstairs, my mother is sitting here washing, washing up the dishes. Um, I walk in and she says, Shlomo, I want to speak to you. Okay, here it comes. She says, I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. <sighs> I'm 43 years old, I can still feel that one. <laughs> not angry, I'm disappointed. You know what every son, every kid wants to tell their parent in that moment? Dechilak, be angry. Why would we want our parents to be angry? That's called killing someone with kindness. They need you to be angry. They need to feel like the thing that they did wrong, like it was wiped from the book. And in order for it to be wiped from the book, you need to get angry. I need to be punished. Kindness in that moment, sometimes a person feels like I didn't pay my due. I'm carrying this still. I, I haven't wiped the book clean. Bore Olam, uh, our rabbis tell us that we're supposed to emulate Hashem. And Hashem is very kind. And yet, the Pasuk says, El Kana, Hashem is a God of retribution. He's a God of revenge. Any of the Mifarshim asked the question, if you're supposed to emulate God and you're not supposed to take revenge, how could you emulate God if God is also a God of revenge? And the answer he gives is he says, you could take revenge with kindness. And I want to share with you, there's an example of this. It's called Lo Tikom Lo... Right? You can't take revenge. Lotikom. But then the Pasuk continues and says, Velo Titor. What's, what's Nikama and what's Nitira? Nikama, Rashi says, you know what Nikama is? I come to your house, I ask you if I could borrow an axe. What do you tell me? No. Tomorrow you come to my house, you say, can I borrow a rake? What do I tell you? No. Yesterday, I came, I asked you if I could borrow your axe. You said, no, I'm not giving you my rake. That's revenge. Not allowed to do that. But then you're also not allowed, nitira, to bear a grudge. What's nitira? Rashi, on the spot, tells us, gives us the example of the Gemara. What's nitira? Nitira is I come to you and I ask you for an axe and you say, no. The next day, you come to my house and you ask me for a rake. And I say, Sure. Even though yesterday when I came to your house and asked you for the axe, you said, no, I was raised a little bit differently. Faddal, here, let me give you the axe. You need help me? Should I help you chop the wood? Can I, should I help you with it? I'm only happy. Should I buy you your own axe? <laughs> I always thought, if I had to be the recipient of one, nikama or netira, which would I rather? Nikama, a thousand percent. Don't you feel worse when the guy gives you the rake? I'd rather not have the rake. <laughs> but what we see from here is that in this moment, the person feels terrible from the kindness you're extending them. So what are you obligated to do? You can't not give the rake. You can't give the rake. What are you supposed to do? Just stand there, mute? No, you're supposed to give the rake and not draw attention to the fact that yesterday he didn't give you the axe. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay? However, what we see from there is that the Torah understood that the nature of a human being sometimes is to punish with kindness. And the brothers in this instance, they felt Louis the man who if only he would hate us. And I think that sometimes in the process of human relationships, if the person does not get upset, if the person does not get angry, they wind up carrying this for quite some time. You got angry, you got it out of your system. The brothers looked at Yosef and they said, how's he going to get this out of his system? This is going to be here forever. 
Think about the way they were thinking. Remember the machloket, the fight between Esav and Yaakov? Esav hated Yaakov. What does Esav say? Yikrivu yemeh evel avi. As soon as my father dies, what's going to happen? I'm going to go kill Yaakov. The brothers thought, probably Yosef is thinking the same thing as Esav. That's what it means, Yosef cried. He says, that's what you think of me? Does you have to come tell me this? This whole story that you made up with Yaakov? You think I'm Esav? That's what you think of me? My friends, I, I can't know, I don't, you know, you, you say, you know, you don't know someone else's life. I don't know if any of your brothers ever sold you down to the Egyptians, threw you in a pit. I, you know, you can never judge, you don't know people's life stories. <laughs> Maybe it happened to you. But assuming it didn't happen to you, what's the lesson for all of us? I think that there's a tremendous, there's a tremendous idea here that when someone has wronged you and you think, I forgave them and the story's over. The guy came to me, he said, I'm really sorry. Your wife came to you, your children came to you, your husband came to you. They asked me, I said, okay, forget it. Don't worry about it, I forgive you. We think that the story's over. But we see from the story is that the story's only over in your heart. It might very well not be over in their heart. And they might be carrying a feeling of guilt because of what they've done that actually could destroy the relationship against your best efforts to forgive. Because they're expecting something from you. They're expecting anger. They're expecting a punishment. And you know what? The fact that you were nice in some ways made it worse. Luis de Menu. Don't be disappointed, Ma. Be angry. Anger I could take. And part of the reason why sometimes we want to be punished is because we want to feel like we're done with it. We paid the price. And if I didn't pay the price, I didn't do the time, then I'm still holding the crime. The answer is the second part of our lesson today. What brought the brothers Vayinachem? Well, how does he how does he comfort them? Vayidaber alibam, and he spoke to their he spoke to their heart. In a certain level, it sounds like what we're being asked to do is very difficult. After someone's upset you, not only do you need to erase, so to speak, forgive, you need to come towards the person sometimes in these situations. And tell them and share with them how much they mean to you. So, I'm not angry, I'm not upset, let's move on. Doesn't do anything. But I'm not angry, I'm not upset at you. How could I be upset at you when you bring so much to my life? Yes, you upset me, everyone makes mistakes, but I'm not angry with you. Because I don't see this one story. I see the wider picture. And even though you brought me some sadness in this story... You bring me so much happiness. Well, I'm going to be upset at you now. When the person realizes how much you value them, that can uproot those feelings. (sighs) What would happen if we could see the feelings as plain as day of someone who had done something wrong to us? What would happen? What would happen? If we could understand that sometimes the reason why they're distant from us is not because they want to be, but because they can't lift their face up to us. How many relationships are broken? Not because there was no forgiveness. You did, not because you didn't forgive. Not because they didn't forgive you but because their, the forgiveness was something that they couldn't accept. A friend of mine, I'll end with this. <clears throat> a friend of mine from London, he used to uh, put together money and bring money to people's houses, bring goods to people's houses, food packages to people's houses, leave it by the doorstep, knock on the door and run away. 
And one of the people that he would bring these food packages to, to their home was actually a friend of his. The day comes, he knocks on the door, leaves the package, turns to run away. As soon as he turns to run away, the door opens. And the guy had been waiting there to see who was leaving him, these, who was helping him. And the two friends come face to face. He didn't know what to do. He, he, was so, he was so embarrassed for the other fellow that the, now the fellow should see that his friend is the one that's taking care of him. He said like, Shabbat Shalom, he ran away. Of course, you can't run away from a good friend. The guy calls him on the phone, he's like, dude, <clears throat> why'd you run away? I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to, he's like, I don't know, I, you know. I, I thought it was embarrassing, you know, it said, I, I just, I didn't know what to do, so I left. He says, no, no, I, I can't tell you how much it means to me. All this time that you've been, he says, me and my wife, you know, we now know that it's you. We want to buy you a present. The guy's thinking to himself, they don't have money for food for Shabbat. They're going to buy me a present. He goes, no, no, it's fine. And the guy says, please, no, please, I want to give you something. I want to get you something. He goes, no, don't worry about it. And he's fighting with the guy and the guy keeps asking him and he keeps denying him. Until he went and he spoke to my rabbi. And he said to Rabbi Berkowitz, and he said, the guy keeps asking me to give, get me a present. I want to do the mitzvah for the right reasons. I don't need any presents. The guy also can't afford the presents. And listen to what my rabbi said to him. My rabbi said to him, are you so selfish that you won't take his present? You don't want to take the present. You want to do the mitzvah the Shem Shamayim. But who's the mitzvah about? You or him? Him. He's so humiliated. He's so embarrassed. The only thing that will give him some sense of dignity is to be able to give you something. And he's asking you to give you something and you're like, no, no, I'm a big sadiq. Shem Shamayim. Sometimes we're so fixated on what we want to give and what we want to take and what we want to do and we forget the other person in that equation he may have different needs than we think he needs a person comes to you to give you an apology I've caught myself doing this many times a person comes to you and you say no, no reason to apologize and the person's like no rabbi still I know but I just wanted to say no, 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 please stop you don't need to apologize I don't need your apology. But you might need to apologize to me. You are uneasy walking around with this. And I won't let you apologize? Who in our life do we need to let apologize? Who in our life do we need to let get us something? Help us with something. Not for us. For them. And if you need someone to learn this from... Who better to learn it from than God Himself? <clears throat> Does Hashem need a korban from us? Does Hashem need a prayer from us? Does Hashem need our mitzvah? He doesn't need any of it. But He knows we need to give it to Him. So God says, please, could you pray shacharit mincha arbi'ay? Could you pray to me? Could you keep Shabbat? Could you do this? Could you do that? He doesn't need any of it. But a true giver sometimes understands that the greatest act of giving they could do is to take something from someone who has something that they need to give. And he comforted them by speaking to their hearts and telling them, you know how much I need you? He's the ruler of Egypt. You don't need nobody. No. Oh, they thought I was this, they thought I was that. When you're a monarch at that time in, 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 in Egypt, do you know what happens if CNN puts out a piece against you? <laughs> you don't fire Chris Cuomo, you kill him. Right? That's what Yosef, someone speaking negatively about Yosef, what does he need to do? Line the guy up, chop his head off. What does he say to his brothers? You don't know how much I need you. Why? Not because he needs them. 
but because they need him to need them. So he graciously takes what they can give in order to be able to help them get past a feeling of guilt that they've been carrying for 22 years plus another 17 years. Think about that. How long ago did they sell him? 39 years ago. Four decades. Vayinachem otam. Vayidaber alibam. Baruch Adonai Leolam.